Shalom everybody and welcome to the Restoration Hour. We hope that you are doing really, really well today and we really want to bless you as you join with us today and we are happy to be with you and we hope that you have had a wonderful time of celebrating Passover as well as Unleavened Bread and now this time of counting the days up to Shavuot, up to what many people call Pentecost. It's such a special time. But even as it's a special time, I've come to realize again just the the absolute need for holiness and how deep it is to look into oneself, you know, all the time and to really be at that point of always looking into yourself and saying, where can I improve and how can I change? And not with a sense of feeling guilty or that there's any kind of, you know, you know, guilt or shame that we carry, but just really that sense of Abba Father, how can you be working in me so that I can become more and more of a holy person? I don't know about you, but you know, even though you may serve Yeshua for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, it's kind of like there's always things that need to be worked out in us because we live in life and things happen and it's, it's just an incredible journey. And there's a few things that we have really witnessed over this Passover season, this short period of that seven days. And we really want to get into that this evening. And I pray that you will join with us because we really want to talk about holy and unholy. I think this year has been quite an eye opener for us and has been quite something that we are starting to see that we haven't really seen before. Something that's starting to happen and manifest that is that is actually quite scary. And I think that we need to really be awakened to what is happening. And before we get into that, you know, I just want to welcome Yosef as well to the Restoration Hour. I hope that you're doing well. And it's going to be really good to be touching on the holy versus the unholy and what is and has been happening, even that we have witnessed and that other people have witnessed during this time. Yosef, it's been quite interesting to see a whole lot of weird stuff going down. Weird indeed. Anyway, everybody, it's great to be with you this week. And um, I'm looking forward, like Leah says, to really just chat with you and to spur you on, as Yahweh says, to righteous living and to a holy lifestyle, a set apart lifestyle. So this evening, I pray that you'll sit back, that you'll join us and let us pray and invite the Father to be with us and his Ruach just to dwell among us and let us share in what the Father says. Father, we want to thank you this day, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. We want to thank you, Abba Father, for these wonderful festivals that you have given us, Father, these rehearsals that you have given us, Father, to to prepare, Father, for your son's soon return, to prepare, Father, our lives so that we can be set apart, so that we can be a kingdom of priests, a royal generation, a holy generation, a royal priesthood, Father, people set apart for your good pleasure. I pray this evening, Father, that as we discuss, Father, what is laid on our hearts, Father, that it will resonate in the hearts and lives of your people, and Father, that it will spur us on, Father, to to be the people, Father, that radiate you in everything that we do. And in order for us to do that, Father, we have to come out from all things, Father, that separate us from you. We have to consider our ways. We have to ask ourselves the question, Father, does this honor you or does it not honor you? Does, does this bring glory to your name or not? So, Father, we pray pray that you will help us this evening, Father, to examine not only ourselves, but to examine the things that we do, Father, and the places where we are and the things that we do, Father, in in your name, so that we can really, Father, be people that are set apart and true to you. We thank you for this, Father, and we give you all the glory and all the honor in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. You know, Yosef, you know, you prayed about being that chosen race and a royal priesthood. And that was really a scripture that Abba Father actually really impacted upon me before we started the Restoration Hour. And, you know, 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10, and I want to read it because it's so important. And you prayed it without even knowing that I was going to read the scripture. But it says that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And I think that people always think that that just applies to them. You know, you're just a a chosen race, this royal priesthood, this holy people, a possession of Yahweh. But what does it mean to live that way we said it you know two or three weeks ago on the restoration hour that the purpose of the israelites coming out of egypt was for them to become yahweh's people yes he chose them and then it was 
for the purpose of covenant. He took them to, you know, Mount Sinai and entered into a covenant with them. And that enabled them to become that chosen people, you know, by fact that they were in a covenant with him. He had chosen them out of all the nations. Now, you know, we realize and know that it wasn't just Egypt that was around. There was a lot of people that were around that Yahweh could have chosen. You know, you had the Egyptians, you had the Hittites, the Sumerians, you had all of the different people that were living all over and he chose Israel. He chose them to enter to that covenant. And the whole purpose of it was so that they could be what? As it says in Leviticus 19, be holy because I am holy. It's a directive. It's a commandment. We've said it how many times. What does this look like? What does holiness look like? You know, the biggest thing that I think has been such a shock and and just a real, and when I say shock, I, I'm, I don't mean disbelief, like as in we haven't been shocked to see this happening, but being really stirred in our spirits that over this Pesach time, this holy set apart time that Yahweh has given to us as his children, as his people, we have witnessed quite some shocking things. And and one of those things is that, you know, in the past, I don't know about you, but I know in the past we, we saw Christians, you know, they would celebrate Easter. Just they they, they were open and we, we celebrate an Easter you guys celebrating Passover, you're a bit weird, you know, you're a bit strange. We have our Easter and this is our Resurrection Sunday and our sunrise service. We're very happy with it. We call it Easter and, and everybody's happy with that, you know. This is for us. You know, Passover is now this feast of the Jews. And that's how it had been for so many years. You know, that's what we had heard. That's what we see. Messianics keep this Passover. Jewish people keep their Passover. And we're celebrating Yeshua's feast. And we see that set apartness coming. You know, that line was drawn in the sand of this is, you know, what Yahweh is doing. He's calling us to the Holy Feast. And the people that don't want to come out, they 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 still celebrate an Easter. But suddenly there's a mixing. And this year we have seen it so profoundly that people are starting to say, Christians are starting to say, Oh, we're celebrating Passover. We're celebrating Passover. Oh, it's Passover this weekend. And I kept hearing this quite a lot. And we kept hearing this quite a lot from, you know, Christian people that we know. And we kept thinking, okay, what is this about? Why are they calling it Passover? And then when this holy set apart time comes, they suddenly go into sunrise services and doing their Easter egg hunts, but they're now referring to it as Passover. And they're actually doing a sort of a Seder. You know, this is something that we've witnessed so prolifically here. People are now doing this sort of Passover Seder. But when you go to the Passover Seder, they're actually eating bread, which is number one, the first thing at their Seder. Number two, not celebrating the Seder as they should be celebrating it, where it's about Yeshua. They've now adopted a Jewish Seder that they're now suddenly doing. And now suddenly people are also now referring to it as, you know, Easter Passover. It's now Easter Passover. The mixing is suddenly becoming so, so evident. And this is this is a shocking reality. We also met a lot of people over this Passover season who are teaching others to keep Pesach, to keep Passover as it is in the Torah. But yet they say we're under the blood of Yeshua, so we don't, so we can eat bread during this time because we're under the blood. The blood has taken that away from us. We have witnessed so many scary things during this season that Yahweh wanted us to witness because he wants us to see what is actually happening. Because he wants us to see that when you take a tiny little bit of truth and you mix it back in with a whole bunch of lies, it makes people so much more deceived. I mean, we have a, a, a set apart time where it says, don't eat leaven on, on Passover. And yet eating bread at the Passover meal, you know, saying, well, I'm under the blood of Yeshua. So then why are you celebrating Passover? Suddenly now Easter sunrise services are, oh, we're here on the beach and we're watching the sunrise, but it's Passover time. And, 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 and you sit there and then suddenly it's, oh, Yeshua went to the grave on Thursday, and that's how he resurrected on a Sunday. We know he didn't go to the grave on Friday, but he went on Thursday, and he resurrected on Sunday. I have no clue what the enemy is up to, but all I'm going to say is that he is trying to fool. Actually, I do have a pretty good idea what he's up to, but he is trying to fool a lot of people. And this, you know what, I must say, 
the line we, we've known for so many of us, maybe most of us sitting here today, we have come out of this pagan system of worship. We no longer want to partake in that. We left it 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever it may be. And we are setting ourselves on this holy path. Now people are coming along who seem to be on the same path. But when you look deeper and you look into their hearts and you look into their actual actions, like James says, faith without works is dead. You will know my faith by my works. You know, when you look at their works, you see a very skewed kind of faith. And now our discernment has to get even deeper. Our, you know, knowledge and wisdom and understanding of Yahweh's will for our life, it has to be even stronger. And our stand for truth has to be even more. Our conviction has to be stronger. And we have to, now, now we are seeing people, you know, kind of almost wanting to partake in our Passover festivals. But like we always say, you cannot come to Passover. We have a very strong rule about this according to the word of Yahweh. You do not come to Passover and then celebrate Easter. You are bringing condemnation on yourself because, you know, Yahweh's word is very clear that this mixing the holy and the unholy, it is so dangerous. I don't know about you. Have you witnessed this during this time? We've been witnessing it and Yahweh has really stirred our hearts and said, he is super displeased. And what is worse is that people are teaching these things. They're teaching Passover Easter. That's exactly what's coming out of their mouth. They're teaching and proclaiming these things, but yet saying, we must keep this, but we're under the blood. Well, what does that mean? But then what does that mean? You know, this is being proclaimed now. The mixing is now starting to be proclaimed. The Christians can no longer deny that Passover is that holy time. But yet they don't want to let go fully of that paganism. They don't want to fully come out of Babylon. Now they're just starting to mix it up. Amen. You know, Leon, when when I see these things and 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 I listen, you know, to like you're saying, what people are saying and, and, and what we've experienced, one thing comes to mind and we have to always um, look at it and, and say to ourselves, you know, and, and be gracious in, in a sense too. But at the same time, we have to use wisdom. So gracious in the sense of saying, well, you know, many people don't always fully understand the truth. And there are some in, in this group that are searching maybe for the truth. But unfortunately, it comes down to one plain thing. And, and this is this is the hard part that many people don't want to take hold of. In the end, it comes down to a simple phrase or a simple understanding that you cannot have the truth without the real author of truth. And unfortunately, the church has wandered so far away from the truth and from who Yeshua is in his, in his context of the Messiah as Messiah who saved the world, as the one who is the Passover lamb who took away the sins of the world. And they have substituted it with so many different things that it's difficult then when you realize halfway through, wait a minute, these things are wrong. You cannot substitute only half of the story or you cannot only change parts of the story to, to kind of make your narrative sound a little bit better so that we fit in to what is now new in the, in the realm of Christianity. We have to go all the way back and ask ourselves the question, where did we go wrong from the very beginning? And the truth of the matter is you cannot put Yeshua into any other context except the context of a Jewish rabbi keeping the Torah of Yahweh, teaching those writings and teachings to his people, expecting his disciples to do the same. So if we take out the Torah and the commandments of Yahweh and the necessity of keeping these things, then the festivals will take on their own meaning. And they'll take on the meaning that, that you will want those things to mean. And every, every teacher of the word, every pastor knows that it's good when you come up and, you, and you're able to teach something that is new or something that is profound or something that catches people's attention. But at the same point, you have to, as a, as a teacher or a pastor, be very careful about how you do that because sometimes you can pick something up, like many people do, and then teach it as if it's truth because it sounds good. And the Passover and, and Sukkot for is another one that is very, you know, the Feast of Tabernacles that's used often by, by the church, but yet it's done in a way that is not 100% true because they don't keep the other parts of the festival and they don't keep the necessity of teaching what that festival means. So we're mixing and, 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 we, and, we, and, we, and we're kind of putting pieces together because we, like you say, we've gotten to a point where religion or Christianity as a whole has got to a point where they cannot deny the fact 
that Easter and these, you know, the festivals that they, Christmas, for example, is wrong. So instead of going back to the foundation and saying, well, you know, this this image or this this kind of understanding of who Yeshua is that we have is incorrect. We have to break that down and we have to get back to the truth. We have to understand, you know, they still like you saying, Ilya, they want to, you know, fit in the three days and three nights because in their mind, they still want Sunday to be the Sabbath. They still want Sunday to be that day because it's it's for them, you know, if we have to keep the Sabbath on any other day, then we're Jewish which is not the truth. So they have this this problem because there is anti-Semitism and there is this this understanding that Messiah Yeshua is not really you know, so many people have a have an issue when when you say to them, Well, do you know that Messiah is actually Jewish? There's there's the struggle in their mind and there's the struggle that goes on. So this mixing is happening because people want to get away from Easter, but then they mixing the truth and, and error and it's promoting what is incorrect, wholly incorrect. And it's actually causing this distinction which is actually causing people to in the end serve two masters because you're still serving idolatry which is mixed in between it and a little bit of truth and it's taking you further and now it's actually going to take you further and further away from Yeshua that you thought you knew from the very beginning and now point you even in a different direction to a different Messiah which is even further from the truth so it's mix this mixing and and causing you to 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 get kind of what's the word I'm looking for um, totally confused. So, as people of of Yeshua, we, you know, we've come out, and lots of us have been celebrating, you know, Passover and the festivals for years. But as we grow, and as the world gets to a point where they have to make decisions, we we going to have to stand more and more on the truth, and we're going to have to, you know, we get labeled because people say, well, you know, you you people who keep these festivals, you have no grace. The truth of the matter is, we do have grace. And, and the grace that we have is to help people to come to a point to realize that this is the way that you have to do it. And in order to share the truth with people, they have to first change their perspective of who Yeshua is. You cannot teach Passover to somebody or, or the festivals to somebody without teaching the truth of what those festivals are all about. And you cannot teach it without the instructions and the, the guidelines that's found in the Torah. So what the church does is they take Passover because it sounds right and it's, and it's good and it's away from Easter. But they don't actually teach the truth of the Passover as it was found in the very beginning. And they also don't teach the truth of the Passover as Messiah Yeshua said. And he came and he said, you know what? Do this now in remembrance of me. In the Jewish Messiah con- concept of who he was as a, as a Hebrew, as a person keeping the Torah of God and keeping those commandments. So if we take him away from that, we're stripping him away from anything and we can put any narrative we want into the Passover story and it will sound right. But in the end, it's causing people to, to be mixed up. And you know, Aliyah, it's not only with, with this. It, it happens um, you know, with so many of these festivals where the church has got to a point where they are and people are writing books. You know, church people and, and authors are writing books on these festivals. But when you read and you, and you get into it, you realize, wait a minute, there is something that is missing here because they still want these festivals with a law-breaking Yeshua. They, they want Yeshua to still be the guy that, you know, we don't need to keep the commandments. We don't need to keep the Torah. We don't need to, you know, keep the dietary laws because what's that got to do with anything? But we want to keep the rest because it sounds right. So we pack we, we're kind of packaging our religion like we want. We're building it on how we want. And it's very, very dangerous. And unfortunately, what's also hard to do with people like this is to take them away and then to share the truth with them because they have a knowledge that, or they have a degree of understanding of you know these festivals but but they have this resistance almost to to the truth to the torah of yahweh and it's the torah the word of yahweh within us that brings life and it brings change and we cannot serve two masters we can't we can't on the one hand still be doing you know the like you said, Easter, Easter sunrise services and then saying, well, you know, it's Passover or, or, or going to church on a Sunday and then we're keeping all these festivals and, and we're trying to do, you know, parts of the Torah, but, but we're messing up because we still want the grace and not the law. We, we, you know, we're still trying to say, well, you know, we're under grace and we're not under the law instead of finding the plateau in between it and keeping it. That's why Yahweh says so clearly, Elia, 
that only a remnant will be saved. Yahweh says that from out of Israel, from out of his people, from out of the church, from out of everybody, there will only be a true remnant that really understands the the oneness of Messiah Yeshua, who he is as Messiah Yeshua to his people and, and the concept of, of what that means for them. And then the festivals in their in their entirety, in their beautifulness, in their in their you know their holiness. There will only be people and you know Elia we, we, we have to say something. I want to say this tonight. We're not pointing a finger at the church because the truth of the matter is within the Messianic movement too, there is a mixing going on. There is a lot of people that are still mixing. And, and if we're mixing Judaism with the truth, we are still out of tune with Messiah Yeshua. If we're taking things from the rabbis and we're mixing that into the way that we do things, then we are not doing what Yeshua said, keep this in remembrance of me. We're doing this in remembrance of what the rabbis told us to do. And that's again, traditions of men. So we're still going backwards. So so in every, in every group in, in the church or whether it be in the messianic movement whichever one we find ourselves in we have to strip away everything and look into it and say messiah what is your truth what is it that you want to show me show me the truth of this festival so that i can apply that to my life let let it be stripped away from everything that man has placed on whether it be you know funny things with swinging a chicken or you know whatever these things might be that we hold on to as people let us get away from that so that we can truly find who you are and what you are trying to say to us in all of this. Mm, it's the same as, you know, putting an egg on the on the Passover plate. You know, that comes from paganism. Mm. And I think people don't realize that. You know, they say, oh, well, you know, because the lamb was roasted, we eat, you know, on that first Passover, we eat an egg. Now, what has an egg got to do with lamb that was roasted? Mm. You know, we roast an egg in the fire. Why an egg? You know, you already have lamb on the plate. Why is there an egg here now? Because we know, and it's so easy. What what do we celebrate on Easter? Easter bunnies mm. and what? Eggs. You know, you do your egg hunt and you do whatever. Suddenly, there's an egg on a Passover plate. And, and when you ask why, they say it's because the lamb was roasted. The Jewish people have an egg on the Passover plate. There's a lot of... Um, Christians, whoever, whatever, that believe in Yeshua, that keep this Passover, that have an egg. Mm. A- and they, they go, it's because of this. But it's not. It's because this paganism has so easily jumped in. And like you said, it leads people to be so confused. And it, and it again, leads them totally to a false Messiah. What happens if people come who now, you know, have, aren't into anything and they come there, you know, and they sit there and then they go, well... Okay, so I'm sitting here for the first time and I'm celebrating Passover and it it resonates with my heart because I do believe in Yeshua, but okay, now I see that we can celebrate it like this and there's an egg and we're eating bread and everything's okay. They're not getting that fullness of that Mm -hmm. truth. And you know, Yahweh, Yahweh, in, in throughout the Old Testament, throughout you know Yahweh's dealings with people, but throughout the Old Testament, we see how Yahweh punishes His people and other nations as well. Well documented how He will punish them for worshiping idols, you know, for worshiping false gods. But Yahweh gets super super upset with His people doing what, sitting at His temple and doing what, crying for Tammuz, mm. for example. Where Yahweh says, you year in my holy place. New year saying, we're worshiping Yahweh, but you're weeping for Tammuz. Mm. And what you're doing, you're looking at the sun rising and weeping for this pagan God, but you're in my holy place. The same as when we have the Exodus. They set up this golden calf. We've said it so many times and said, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. His name is Yahweh. Mm. So they have the right name and they have the right, you know, concept because yes, Yahweh did bring them out of Egypt. And yet I'm setting up my own way of worship because what he's doing, you know, doesn't make sense to me. Moses is gone 40 days and 40 nights. The mediator is gone. We need a new mediator between us and God. So we're going to set up this one and we're going to call it Yahweh. We're going to say it's Yahweh. We're going to celebrate to him. And, and yes, we have the name right, but we don't have the concept right. And Yahweh despises that. And Yahweh dislikes that. And Yahweh, I'll go so far as to say, of course, Yahweh hates it. It is why his people were punished over and over again. It's one thing to just set up an idol and, and never worship Yahweh and just say, I'm worshiping this idol. 
you know i'm a i'm a hindu and i'm just worshiping this idol i'm happy with this you know that's that's one form of of this but there's another form when you set up the idol and you kind of keep passover and you kind of keep easter and you kind of call it yahweh and you mix in a lot it's the same thing and yahweh yahweh says that's that what that's what gets you tossed out from him what happened at that golden calf what happened you know what i mean there was conflict that broke out there you know there was death that took place mm. there was a what happened there Yosef there was a setting apart Sorry. you know the Levites were the only one that truly joined themselves to Yahweh and said if you know who's for Yahweh who's for the true God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob the Levites went over on that side and said that they had to kill their brethren that that were doing this false worship mm. and that's how they got that covenant of priesthood because they were the ones that said we're not going to participate in doing this worship and we will pick up arms and and strike down our brothers who are doing this false worship and then they get this covenant made with them that that's why they become priests and that is such a foreshadow of what will happen in our time you know like you said it's not about maybe picking up a spear and being a penchas driving it through someone else you know maybe it's not going to be like that or it's not going to be like what the levites did but it will be a standing up, you know, and a standing up and saying, I now am making the choice. And yes, I may come across as being crazy to other people and other people might not like it, but it is what it is because I'm not part- participating in this thing of saying this is Yahweh, but it looks, it looks, sorry to say, you're saying it's Yahweh, but it looks like some Ashtoreth pole because you're still hiding bunnies. Mm. You know, you mentioned the, the Exodus and, and, you know, the golden calf. And again, if you look at that story, like you said, the interesting thing is they were worshipping as if they were worshipping to Yahweh that was on the mountain and the mountain was busy, you know, burning with fire. But Moses, the mediator, was missing. And today we have the same problem. Yeshua is not around. He's not here. But we have to believe in who he is. And if you have a misunderstanding of who Yeshua is, you're going to land up causing yourself to build a golden off calf in honor still of Yahweh and you, you're going to do these festivals and you're going to do all, all these things and you're going to think that what you're doing is right because your mediator is actually missing or your concept of who the mediator is is incorrect so you 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 still believe that Yahweh is who he says he is but your way of worship has become corrupt and then you you land up like Aaron and them did causing you know this golden calf and then turning around and saying oh well you know I put the gold in and out came this this calf and unfortunately Unfortunately, today, many people don't see a problem with, with, with things like holiness. They don't see a problem with or the importance of being holy. And you mentioned right in the very beginning that Yahweh from the very beginning has told us. He has said, what do I desire from you, O man, O woman? What do I desire from you but for you to be holy as I am holy? And Yahweh throughout the ages, you know, we yes, we do live under grace today. But we see that Yahweh clearly states that if you do this and you come into my presence in an unholy manner, what happens? Death occurs or separation. And we think today that that by doing whatever we want and by serving Yahweh in any way that we want, that just because we're not physically dying immediately like Uzziah did or like, you know, the people, uh, the Israelites did when, when, um, you know, that uh, Pinchas took the spear and went through his countrymen and so many of them were dying already before that. But, you know, what we don't understand is that we are dying spiritually from Yahweh. We are we are lacking the understanding of an intimacy with Yeshua that we need to to be able to survive these last days. And that's the problem with so many people today. By mixing, we're actually causing ourselves to become more and more susceptible to the spirit of the age. And if the spirit of the age is the one that's going to drive us away from the Father, then in the end of days, when there is an anti-Messiah, it's just going to be a matter of bowing down because you're, going, you're not going to know the difference between the true image and the false image. And he has instituted these days. We know that from the very beginning, you know, the, the enemy has instituted things like Easter and Christmas. And now that there is an awakening to the truth, shouldn't it be in our best interest and our desire to know the full truth and not just a little bit of truth? Yahweh and Yeshua in his, in his grace and in his mercy is calling people 
to understand. So it starts by, by Passover maybe or by some of the festivals or getting told, hey, you know what, Sunday was not actually the day that Yeshua rose. Then it is our responsibility as children of Yahweh, if we call ourselves children of Yahweh, then not to go and listen again to someone else's uh, perception or, or understanding, but to stop and pray and to say, Yahweh, show me the way, show me the truth so that I can learn. And then you can come out from those places and really understand. Mm. It's getting fired up here this evening. So good to be with you all in the Restoration Hour this evening. I think we probably all, if we were together, we'd have a lot to talk about and to discuss. And I feel like this is such a, a reality, you know, it's a reality that we're not sitting and saying, oh, well, this is what we see and we're getting all upset about it. No, not at all. It's a reality to say, you know, this is something that we have witnessed this year. And the more that Yosef and I have kind of pushed it away during this festival time and being like, this is what we've seen, but yeah, we're just focusing on what you want us to do and we're just focusing on on our feast with you and we want to just be in that space. The more, you know, Abba Father is burdening us and saying like, you know, this is this is this is not pleasing to me. This is not good for me. And you know, this is not this is not what my heart is is after. My heart is after the holiness. And I think Yosef, that is the big point here as well it's that desire for holiness and i think that that's what really sets people apart that's what sets you know the sheep apart from the goats it's Mm -hmm. whether that desire for holiness is at your heart it's easy to sometimes mix things a lot of times people mix things because they're trying to please the crowd like you said you know you said earlier on it's like you want to come with that new thing or sometimes people do start to learn the truth and they realize the depth of it and then they go gosh this is not going to be really acceptable to my family or this is not going to be acceptable to you know my bible study group or the people i know so let me make it more acceptable to them by kind of bringing it away across in a way that is approachable you know so it begins to be about the people it begins to be about satisfying the people around them around you instead of going actually I'm going to do this with grace, but I have to speak the truth. And truth is always difficult. You know, truth always stings at your core when you're not willing to accept what it is. And we can't make it more approachable for people. We can't make it more easy going for them it has to be a fact of going you know Yahweh is holy and that's what what it's about and there's so many scriptures 1 Peter 1 16 says since it is written you shall be holy because I am holy Leviticus 11 says for I am Yahweh your God consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy because I am holy and Peter he goes on and on and says but as he who called you is holy you also be holy in all of your conduct in fact Peter is the one who consistently speaks about holiness who consistently speaks about being a chosen generation about being a set-apart priest and that's really really interesting isn't it but now I have a question I, I I'm I'm now going to my congregation and I'm listening to what the pastor says on a, on a weekly basis and I'm praying and I'm asking the father to help me to be set apart but I still do certain things I, I go to church on a Sunday I do all different kinds of things I don't keep the festivals so how then am I not holy you know, yes. Are you doing like a repentance? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, exactly. So how am I not holy? You, you see, tell that, me. Th- this is this is where where things start to get tricky. When somebody will say, "Well, you know what? I've been I've been saved for ten years or eleven years, and I've seen the Spirit of God work in my life. I've seen you know people being healed. I've you know I've prayed for people. I I speak in tongues. I have the gifts of God." Oh. But the truth of the matter is that God gives us an understanding and gives us this ability to do what we need to do with the limited understanding that we have. That doesn't mean that you're not saved. It doesn't mean that you're not trying to walk in holiness. But once you have been given a greater understanding to the truth, there is this understanding or this this requirement then from you as a person that Yahweh is calling into a deeper relationship to choose then whether you're going to go deeper or not. So the truth of the matter is, and I think this is where things get really, really tricky and where people struggle because we we've been we've been kind of 
uh, how do I say, spoon-fed religion and said that this is what religion tells us is holy and, and righteous and good. So we think that by doing those things, like you said, going to youth on a Friday night or going to church on Sunday or doing our home cell group, that that makes us holy. But it's not necessarily what makes us holy. Those are good things. They're things that, that help us and aid us. But Yahweh tells us in his word, these are the things that I consider holy or profane. So when Yahweh shows us the way and he shows us the truth and he says to you and, and reveals to you, hey, you know what? You shouldn't be going to church on a Sunday because that's not actually the day that I, that I set apart. I want you to go and read in the word what it actually says or I want you to discover Passover. So then it is your responsibility now that you know to choose Yahweh's way of holiness, not man's way of holiness or religion's way of holiness. There's a difference. We think that, that, that religion's way of holiness is holiness, but Yahweh says in his word, you shall not eat these things, you shall not do these things, you shall not, you know, you shall not kill, steal, all these, kind, all these things Yahweh gives us, but it's way more than just the Ten Commandments. So once we begin to know that, then our life changes to go onto Yahweh's highway and Yahweh's way of doing things. And I think that's where people struggle because they have this this battle inside of them saying but you know what i've seen yahweh move i've seen yeshua do things now you're telling me that i'm not holy or now you're telling me that i'm not doing what yahweh requires of me so 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 who's lying to me and as soon as we feel lied to as soon as we feel like like everything that we've done is wrong we pull away and we pull away from the truth we pull away from from what yahweh is trying to draw us into and then we go backwards and then we we can land up being mixing even more because we we're so confused we don't want to do what's wrong but we also don't want to do what's 100 percent right so we begin to mix because the the right way is the hard way it's difficult and it's it, it it takes something from us and it could even cause you to lose your friends in the church or lose your friends in certain places because Yahweh is saying narrow is the way that leads to life and I want you to walk in it but it takes you getting into the place where you realize Yahweh's way of holiness is found in his word it's not found in religion it's not found in in some kind of doctrinal thesis it's found in Yahweh's word and that's where we have to decide what is holy and what is not so it's difficult mm. in that I love that you asked this question. I think it's such an important question. I've met a lot of people and even people that I know now, you know, who I experience a great power of Yahweh's spirit when I'm around them. You know, my spirit gets excited because you can connect spirit to spirit. You know, Mary and Elizabeth, when they saw each other, they were both pregnant. You know, Mary with Yeshua, Elizabeth with John, you know, John, who would become John the Baptist as we know him, you know, and, and just the excitement and the spirit that they connected in, you know, the, you know, John leaping in his mother's womb and just that experience of life giving presence of, of the Holy Spirit. It speaks about it, you know, and I've experienced people that are like that, that are not even in the Torah that have just a real big love and I'm sure many people listening today to us will probably say well maybe that was me or maybe I know people like that and how do I sh how should I see someone like that you know because they they're not in the the Torah they don't keep these holy things they don't keep the feast they worship on a Sunday but yet they carry you know the the Holy Spirit and this is the thing you know you can be saved baptized and filled with the Spirit but it's that Spirit and and that love that relationship that you have with the Father that is going to lead you I believe that Yahweh will reach out to you and will try and lead you to his truth I think we often forget that, you know, the way of Yahweh is an ancient way. And we cannot, like you said, we cannot substitute it and make it a modern way and go, oh, well, this is just what he wants from us today. You know, if I just go to youth or if I just do all these kind of modern things, then we will be okay. You know, Romans also talks about when people who, you know, are saved, so to say, when people do things by their conscience, you know, your conscience convicts you without having a knowledge of the Torah, without having the knowledge of the truth. There is a, a level of acting in accordance with Yahweh's will because your conscience convicts you. It's the same as, you know, I remember being a young teenager and being with friends and going to shop and my friends wanted to steal some sweets you know this is what happens probably to all of us as teenagers you know your friends are no, just you no 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 can't just be you know I, I wasn't stealing it i just want to say i was standing there and they were trying to put bubble gum in their pocket and 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 there's a conviction that happens inside of you you know 
there's a voice inside of your head and it's not your parents because you know I don't know if my par- my parents probably told me not to steal but that wasn't what it was there was something deeper within my heart that was just like this is wrong mm. but the more that I went to the shop with my friends and the more that I see them stealing sweets the the more that I kind of truthfully by the third time seeing them steal sweets it kind of became a bit less to me to think that what they're doing is wrong the first time the second time I'm really upset about it but by the third time I'm beginning to keep quiet and just saying well you know I can't stop them so it is what it is and I believe that that's what Yahweh does he really does reach out to us we have a level of you know that image of Yahweh within us although it's marred and broken but yet Yahweh's spirit is there to help us do what lead us into all the truth And so it was the same when you and I met and a lot of people have asked us that question. How did, you know, how did Yosef come into the truth? How did he come into into this Torah, you know, because I was in it for like about five or six years. And then when we met, you were a Bible college student. We fought consistently about the word of Yahweh, me saying, well, a lot of it's written in Hebrew and this is Jewish people. And you'd be like, no, 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 this is a Greek world. And we had all these arguments until one day it was like, we can't do this anymore. We can't fight about the word anymore. We have to make a decision on 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 where our life is going. And it was really from my side, a point of prayer saying to you, you have to convince this person or otherwise I don't know. And then you praying without us, either of us knowing you praying and saying, Yahweh, okay, you know, God, if this is the truth, then you have to show me. If what she is saying is the truth, then you have to show me. And yeah, we did show up, but it was your heart to ask him, is this truth or not? And I remember you also saying to me something that people often say, and that is, well, if this is the truth, then why hasn't God told me? And how many times have we heard people say that? If this Torah and this stuff that you're telling me is the truth, then why hasn't God told me? Well, maybe he is, but he's actually just speaking through someone else, and that's difficult, you know? But then again, it's about, like I'm saying, having that heart to go to him and say, okay, so if this is the truth, then you need to show me. And that's the essence of, of it as well. A person, you know, that has the spirit of Yahweh needs to have that heart as well, that that heart of, of humility to say, if this is truth, then Yahweh have to show me. And we should have that heart throughout our whole lives, not just about the Torah, but about our conduct. You know, we could be keeping Torah, but still be actually a a little Torah as we understand it, but still be participating in that which is unholy. Because we often forget that Torah is not just about the dietary laws and the feasts, but it's also about how we treat others. It's about the kindness we show to the earth. You know, taking care of the earth and stewarding it well is in Yahweh's Torah. It's in Leviticus where it says that you don't take a bird who is sitting on its eggs and you don't take the eggs and kill the mother bird at the same time. If you're going to take the eggs and eat it, you're going to let the mother bird go. Why? Because that is a kindness to the earth. You don't kill that at the same time. You don't do that. You know, you don't, it says, you don't cut down trees that bear fruit. Why? Because this is taking care of the earth. You're going to cut down trees that bear fruit and there's going to be no food for people. It just makes sense, doesn't it? And so, in effect, Yahweh is also teaching us what it means to be kind. And so, there's that level, too, of holiness that we have to reach. And that's found in Torah. And that's an ancient path. It's an ancient way. It's not just dietary laws. And that's something that Messianics have got caught out on. We focus so much on dietary laws and feast times. And we focus so much on the things that are quite important when we actually also forget there are other things that are also important, Yosef. And that is to love our, our parents. And it's to love one another. And it's to take care of the earth. And it's to show kindness. And it's to be so many things you know when Yahweh said to the Israelites who had flat roofs that they needed to put that grate on so that a person wouldn't fall off the roof it was because you were protecting human life and today we don't have those flat roofs but yet what is the deepest spiritual principle then that I'm learning here that every life is sacred and I should do my utmost best in my world to protect human life. And so there is a depth of Torah and a depth of holiness that we need to reach. And I think that by some level and some standard, Yosef, we have to say that that is where a lot of Christian people do actually keep Torah without realizing it. Those that do really love others, those that really do, and we have friends that really do serve the homeless, 
with so much love and compassion mm. that their keeping of Torah in that way is so much greater than mine. You know, that depth of love and serving. Those who get on planes and go and serve other people out of a selflessness, you know, go and help refugees or go and help where they can. That in essence, in a part, we have to understand is also keeping Torah. We have to understand that because that is part of what Yahweh says to what? Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, strength and love others as we love ourselves. And that is part. And I believe that that is why Yahweh can also share his Holy Spirit with mm. people who maybe don't keep the feast yet, who maybe don't do these things yet. But his hope is that they will come into that fullness instead of mixing it up, you know, and get to that point of holiness. Amen. So brothers and sisters, this evening I want to challenge you as we get ready and we start to prepare for Shavuot that's coming soon. I really do uh, do pray that, you know, from now until then that we will look at our own lives and ask ourselves these questions. You know, what things have I adapted or what things have I taken on and what stories or what, you know, what understanding do I have of this festival that is not of you, Yahweh? And and not only, you know, to be to be a person that's okay, so let's, you know, walk in the holiness. Yes, that's something that we need to do. But at the same time, we need to get to a point where we're asking the Father, what is it that you want to say to me this year? What is it that you want to reveal to me? And and in order for him to reveal himself to us, we have to get rid of those things that cause separation between ourselves and him. You know, there's a scripture and I, I want to read it to you. It's found um, I just want to find it quickly. It's It talks about without holiness, no man will be able to see Yahweh. And in order for us, especially now, as we prepare for, you know, for Shavuot, Shavuot is all about getting to stand in the presence of the king, getting to, to receive that ruach and receive the gift that Yahweh wants to give to us. So it says this in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see Yahweh. Our aim, brothers and sisters, in this life is to dwell in the presence of the mighty King, to dwell with Him. He wants to dwell with us and we want to dwell with Him. And in order to do that, we have to look at ourselves and say to ourselves, are we walking in the holiness that Yahweh requires? Is it the holiness that people talk about? Or is it the holiness that comes by keeping this Torah that He has given us and walking in His ancient ways and in the ways that He has given us and doing it out of a, a, a heart that is full of love, a heart that is full of love for him and not just out of this 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 yes obedience is is there but obedience is come or, or formed because we love him and if we love him then we'll walk in obedience and we'll do it because of our commitment to him so often we we do things because we think that we have to do it and if we're not going to do it we're going to be punished mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is Yahweh doesn't work like that he wants us to do it because we love him and then by doing it we're part of his family and we learn and we grow and we mature so now until Shavuot is a time that is given to us so that we can prepare our hearts prepare our lives and get rid of those idols get rid of those things that are in our hearts that separate us from the father and really consecrate consecrate ourselves to him you know i'm reminded of of when the israelites were were told to meet and moses told them and yahweh said that they need to prepare themselves for three days and on the third day i will meet with them and it's important for us to realize that there is this this requirement from yahweh of consecration that we consecrate ourselves to him and you know year in and year out we go through the year and we pick up so much offense and and we give offense to people and we cause problems as we go through life it's just part of life sometimes and and hurt happens and and pain happens so we've given we've been given this time where we can look at ourselves and ask the father show me in my own life the things in the areas of my heart that have separated me from you and it might not be idolatry it might be pain it might be hardship or negative words or things that people have said that have caused our hearts to become callous and hardened between ourselves and, and, and Yahweh. And Yahweh wants us to take this time and look at ourselves and say, hey, you know what? I want to prepare my heart. I want to prepare my life. I want to get ready for your outpouring. I want to get ready for what you have in store for me. And that's what Shavuot's about. It's about him giving us his truth and putting that truth in our hearts so that we can go out and be what he's called us to be, as you said, from the very beginning, a kingdom of priests, a royal 
generation, a royal priesthood, a holy generation set apart. People that are peculiar. We're supposed to be peculiar. Yeah? We're supposed to look different to the rest of the world. It doesn't mean that we have to act different and be all strange, but we should radiate a changed heart. We should radiate our Messiah and who he is to the world. So I pray, brothers and sisters, that as you prepare your heart and your life and you begin to get ready for the next festival that will be coming, that you will look at your own life. Paul says very clearly, he says, examine yourself. Test and see if you're in the faith. He says, don't let someone else examine you. Don't, don't, you know, don't weigh yourself up by someone else, but you yourself examine according to the Torah of Yahweh, according to the word of Yahweh, and look and see, are you living up to the standard? There is only one standard to live by, and it's the standard that Yahweh has given us. If your life is not reflecting what the word of Yahweh says, then you need to take a step back and ask yourself why. And Paul says, test, continually test and see if you're walking in the truth. It is only by testing and asking the Father to show us that we'll be able to understand and do what he requires of us. Hmm. 